Hello and welcome to Business Standards Morning Show. I am Ruchika Chatravanshi and let us take a look at the stories for today. Just over a month after it announced a 76,000 crore rupees incentive plan for semiconductor manufacturing, the government last Saturday claimed to have received five proposals for setting up of semiconductor fabrication and display fabrication units worth 1.53 lakh crore rupees in the country. Will India become a global semiconductor manufacturing hub in the next few years? Our next report tells us more. In September 2021, flustered by the government's lack of clarity on its policy for chipmakers, Israel-based chipmaker Tower Semiconductor had threatened to pull the plug on its plan to set up a facility in India. The company had been in consultations with the government for several years. In a letter, Tower Semiconductor had called for Prime Minister Narendra Modi's intervention to fast-track a government proposal for chip manufacturing. It also wrote to the government six months after the latter started inviting chipmakers to India. The company had also stated that any delay on the government's part would mean that it would be unable to stay active in the project in the near future. The company was the technology partner of a consortium formed by Abu Dhabi-based Next Orbit Ventures to set up a chip plant in Gujarat's Dholera. About three months later, the government unveiled a $10 billion production-linked incentive scheme to attract semiconductor and display manufacturers, which seems to be bearing fruit. In the past decade and a half, India had tried unsuccessfully on several occasions to attract chip makers. Therefore, the current response shows the company's confidence in the government's ability to provide the right infrastructure and incentives to build a semiconductor ecosystem. The government has received proposals worth $20.5 billion from five companies for setting up semiconductor and display fabrication units. Vedanta was the first one to hop on. A joint venture of Vedanta and Foxconn, a consortium led by Abu Dhabi-based Next Orbit Ventures and IGSS Ventures of Singapore are the three companies that submitted applications for semiconductor plants. The applications have been received for setting up 28 nanometer and 65 nanometer fabs with a projected investment of $13.6 billion. They have sought support from the center to the tune of $5.6 billion. The next Orbit Ventures-led consortium's technology partner remains Tower Semiconductor, which was recently acquired by Intel for $5.4 billion. This time, the government is being seen as more welcoming of chipmakers than before. Vedanta and Elest, a subsidiary of gold jewellery retailer Rajesh Exports, have submitted proposals worth $6.7 billion to manufacture display fabs. They have sought incentives of $2.7 billion. This time, there is a lot of hand-holding going on like for example in the past it was you had this set of uh, what you call um, incentives you take it and leave it so here the approach is completely different so they have set up the india semiconductor mission which is supposed to be on the similar lines as indian space mission right so while as the the previous one what happened in 2009 or 2010 time frame and and it was treated like any other industry so it, it has to be treated differently and this time it has been treated differently uh, this time the government is willing to um, basically put their portion at the start semiconductors really needs that kind of handling if you don't if you handle it uh, like any other industry uh, so it will reach the same fate what uh, happened in the last time so so this time government is equal partner see 28 nanometers still continues to be really relevant. What is happening is because of the 5G, a lot of IoT applications are getting enabled. And for IoT kind of devices, you really don't need to go into the uh, five nanometer or sub five nanometer, 28 nanometer. In fact, 65 nanometer is more than enough for IoT. In fact, you can even go um, uh, maybe lower than that as well. From the government perspective, I think their biggest challenge is now to pick up um, uh, the top two. I think they have to put for the fab and two for the display. So I think so that will be uh, a good exercise to be done. And we need to ensure that we pick up the right people. 
because none of us want to fail this time. And the last thing we want to fail is because of picking the, uh, the wrong set of companies. I'm very happy and excited about the government of India's initiative to develop a very holistic ecosystem for semiconductor manufacturing, semiconductor design, research, and talent development. Incentive package of $10 billion is one of the best incentive packages in the world. Government has worked with industry and other ecosystem players in a very consultative mode for last one year to come up with this policy. This is only a beginning of the work. We still need to make sure the we get the right investors to invest into this uh, uh, ecosystem. Also provide them the right infrastructure, right enabling ecosystem, and also aggregate the semiconductor demand so the wafer capacity created by these companies uh, can be successful. The duty of the government does not just end with the creation of a successful atmosphere for the semiconductor industry. It has larger problems to tackle. Making chips is an electricity and water intensive affair that creates hazardous waste. The manufacturing process also involves toxic gases and chemicals that are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. Greenpeace estimates that the world's largest chipmaker TSMC alone uses 4.8% of Taiwan's electricity annually. This is expected to rise to 7.2% this year as production at new plants begins in TSMC's home country. When Taiwan was hit by a drought last year, TSMC ordered water from trucks to ensure no disruption to its manufacturing. When the government prioritized the supply of water to chipmakers, this led to tensions between the companies and the farmers. Environmental impact is something that India should keep in mind as it fosters a semiconductor ecosystem. The semiconductor market of India is estimated to touch $63 billion by 2026, compared to $15 billion in 2020. While the government's labor to boost semiconductor manufacturing in India is bearing some fruits, it is still toiling hard to bring the railway's expenditure on track. Our next report explains how. In 2016-17, while 11% of railway's capital expenditure, CapEx, was funded by internal sources, in 2019-20, the ratio dropped to less than 1%. A 2015 committee on restructuring of railways had flagged that over-reliance on borrowings could exacerbate the financial situation of railways. Yet financial ratios have deteriorated over time. The operating ratio, the amount Indian Railway spends to earn Rs 100, has increased drastically over the years. In 2012-2013, it spent 90 rupees to earn 100 rupees. In 2019-20, it had to spend 98 rupees to earn 100 rupees. For the last two years, CAG has been highlighting how Railways is adjusting advance payments to manage its operating ratio. In 2017-18, for instance, Railways took advance payment from freight from NTPC and IRCON, which helped decrease its operating ratio from 102.7 to 98. Similarly, in 2018-19, it took an advance from NTPC and Concord to improve its operating ratio from 101.8 to 97.3. In the recent union budget, the government hiked capital expenditure by 35.4%. Of this 7.5 trillion rupees to be spent on capex, one in every five rupees will go towards the railways. Budget mathematics tends to indicate a revival. Data released by the government shows that receipts are expected to grow 18.8% over last year. In contrast, expenses will rise 16.6% in 2022-23, leaving the railways with 5,360 crore rupees extra for allocation to its other funds. The depreciation reserve fund is included in these calculations. The excess only accounts for 2.2% of the total receipts. It will be the highest in the last seven years. The calculations are predicated on the back of a 13.6% rise in goods and a whopping and unprecedented 31.8% rise in passenger earnings. In 2021-22, goods revenue grew 23% as the railways cornered a significant share of the freight traffic. Though the railway seems to be pulling through in budget mathematics, a business standard analysis shows that the space for India's largest public sector operator is shrinking. Barring last year, when passenger revenues jumped 191% on the back of a low base, 
passenger revenues have never grown in double digits in the last six years. Growth in goods revenue last hit double digits in 2017-18. Sundry earnings money the railway earns from advertising and leasing were declining even before the pandemic hit the sector. The railways now expects these earnings to grow 42% to 10,000 crore rupees in 2022-23, a target last reached in 2016-17. Further analysis shows that the railways has never met its budget target for passenger earnings in the last six years and has even fallen short of its sundry earnings target. The failings are evident on the expenditure side as well. Even though the allocation has been reduced in terms of depreciation reserve fund, the railways has not even met those targets. The finances that the railways accounts for are coming from gross budgetary support and extra budgetary resources, not from the transport utilities' own revenues. Here's what needs to be done to get the railways back on track. The share of railways with respect to road is declining. In 1950, it was 80 percent. Now it is declined to 10 percent in passenger and 27 percent in freight. Uh, need is to increase it. and how to increase it there are constraints one first biggest constraint is capacity uh, number of lines required number of double lines required number of quadruple lines required the speed of the goods train speed of the passenger trains and terminal capacity another thing which has affected is inadequate expansion of container traffic uh, still you see the container traffic forms only 4 to 5% of the total freight carried by railways high dated traffic is almost gone out of railways and logistics say a customer demands go down to go down which should be avoided so railways ability to tie up terminals uh, transportation from go down to terminals book from go down to go down this has affected and at lastly the policy say policy to take whatever is offered what is what is whether it is small whether it is high rated and then make a plan to take it in the reasonable time appropriation to the development fund capital fund and rashtriya rail sanraksha kosh partly won by the central government have all declined in the last 6 years the average appropriation to these funds has just been 30% of the budgeted amount In many years the appropriation was even less than 20% of the budgeted amount although the railways was to contribute 5000 crore rupees each to the rashtriya rail sanraksha kosh for track repair works by the end of this year its contribution will be just 1/4 of the budgeted estimates instead the expenditure is increasingly being shifted to extra budgetary resources this year's demand for grants has also made a provision for the railways to contribute some amount towards debt servicing The center gave the service provider a break on debt servicing given its dwindling finances. How much of that the organization can achieve will only be apparent in the coming months. After the railways, let us move on to markets. The Russia-Ukraine standoff is keeping investors on their toes. Yesterday too, the frontline indices oscillated between gains and losses before closing in the red. With no domestic triggers in focus, investors have their eyes fixed on the geopolitical developments in Eastern Europe. Business Standards Puneet Vadha caught up with R Venkatraman, chairman at IIFL Securities, to know if the market's bottom is near. Uh, let me begin by asking you uh, do you think that the global financial markets including india have overreacted to the uh, likelihood of the us fed's uh, aggressive uh, rate hike and geopolitical situation with ukraine if you see the way markets behave they tend to overreact on both sides on the good news also on the bad news also so as of now what we are seeing in the world is the fed rate hikes or the risk of a very fast and a steep uh, rate hike cough by the us fed and uh, what happens typically when the fed raises hike is that as a group as a cohort all flows in the world get tend to get affected especially emerging market flows so clearly what is happening is that people are afraid that emerging market flows across the globe that those flows will be affected then you have the situation in ukraine ukraine is a real geopolitical uh, issue simply because it is like going back to the cold war days 
uh, of the 70s and 80s before the Berlin Wall crashed. And then Ukraine is very uniquely placed because it is like a transit hub for energy, which is crude and natural gas. So uh, all in all, we have an interesting cocktail of uh, Fed rate hike, very high valuations, a geopolitical situation which can effectively lead to hike in crude and natural gas prices, which again will fuel inflation and uh, again have a, um, some kind of negative feedback loop into this uh, interest rate hike. Clearly, the markets are nervous and uh, markets are correcting. But to be fair, the corrections, uh, Ukraine is like, a, I would say, the last straw on the camel's back because markets have started correcting sometime in advance on fears of the Fed rate hikes. If you see even the uh, uh, global markets, say NASDAQ and Dow, many stocks are down significantly, although the markets optically are still remaining at an elevated level. Uh, so this is a part and parcel of natural normal correction because post-COVID of 2020, we have had a one-way rally in the markets. So... Uh, typically, when you have a one day rally in the markets, market should also correct. So that's healthy for it. So I would say that we are in a healthy correction mode. So do you see more chances of a downside from the current levels or uh, we are close to bottoming out? So on the Indian markets, I think what has happened is that you have two contra forces at work. The first force is, uh, I would say, on the negative that the foreign flows are weakening and i i think for the if, for after a long time we have seen month after month of incessant fii selling the good news is that obviously the domestic uh, equity flows have improved we are almost we are seeing 10000 crores of equity sip uh, which is actually very strong so that is a, a good news on the liquidity front so we have uh, uh, foreign selling countered by domestic buying uh, but the interesting thing is that in my opinion the real uh, uh, macroeconomic situation in India is improving uh, step by step. And we have a good budget in which the government of India is talking about a huge outlay in capex spending, which is again very good because it, that, that will leads to uh, real economic growth over a period of time. But uh, on the other side, we have valuations at a very high level because earnings growth has yet to catch up. And again, India also, like uh, we have seen in uh, across markets across the globe, Post the COVID pandemic of March 2020, when the Nifty fell below 10,000, uh, we have had a continuous rally because we had a one-way rally. And uh, so effectively what is happening is that the markets are taking a breather. And in my opinion, that markets will remain subdued. They will wait and watch and see how the uh, interest rate hike scenario works out. What happens to inflation? Because remember, CPI is at 6%, but WPI is at 13%. So, so there is some kind of gap between CPI and WPI, which the market has to digest and resume the rally once there is clarity on the earnings flow. So short term, I'm not short term. I think the markets will remain lackluster. And after the first quarter results of next year, when there'll be a clear outlook on how earnings growth for FI23 will pan out, then we'll see a rally upwards. Okay. So on a long term, medium term, I'm quite optimistic. On a short term, I'm not so optimistic. So where do you see the leadership emerge from? Uh, if, if, if the market has to even sustain at these levels or uh, you know move up uh, over the uh, medium to long term from here on? My guess is that uh, if you see the leadership things, then IT is clearly a good sector to be in, good space to be in. Uh, banking and financial services should do uh, well simply because uh, it looks as if the NPA problems are behind us and, and credit growth will come back to the economy. CapEx spending will come back to the economy. Ca CapEx cycle, again, should do well because of uh, the fact that the, the, the finance minister talked about a 5 lakh, 7 lakh uh, crore uh, CapEx spend. And uh, these are the three segments which I think would uh, do well. And which can, can be the sore points? I think FMCG uh, will see uh, inflationary pressures on the cost side and also valuation. They don't have the comfort of valuation. So that is one sector which I think will... Uh, underperform. Although uh, the co companies in the FFC space are all very high quality companies, but uh, my only co concern in that segment is because they are priced to perfection. So, uh, how do you think uh, the retail investors are looking at these developments? Uh, are they a bit cautious now before putting in their money? My overall sense is that the retail investor has shown a lot of maturity in this time around because most of the money is coming from mutual fund SIPs because the SIP inflows on a month-on-month -month basis also at a record high and we are crossing 10,000 crores very comfortably. Because of continuous evolution in education, uh, advances made in tech, so the retail investor is behaving quite, uh, I would say, sensibly. So what has been your strategy in terms of uh, investment in, across sectors uh, in equity and debt over the past couple of months? See, in the debt side, uh, we are we are suggesting to uh, uh, to look at the shorter end of the cycle simply because the rate hike is, uh, uh, will happen. So if you have a long-dated paper, then obviously you'll get 
uh, hit. So either you look for FM, a fixed tenure kind of thing or look for short term and wait for a better opportunity to enter. On the equity side, we are recommending our customers uh, that uh, uh, you should, uh, first of all, pare down your expectations because the last two years we have got 20% plus growth. The mid cap had done very well. So that kind of returns will not happen. So A, have rational expectation of returns and B, continue to remain invested simply because the macro macroeconomic cycle is going to turn. How do you think the LIC IPO uh, will play out? See, LIC's IPO will be one of the biggest uh, e- events in Indian capital market history. So maybe after 10, 15 years, when people look back upon on the history of capital markets, then LIC will be a big event. But my guess is that the 65,000 crores of liquidity, suck out what you are saying, will happen. But that market will digest in a matter of uh, maybe a month and then then uh, come back. But it will be a big event in the Indian capital markets, without doubt. Thank you, Mr. Venkataman, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Puneet. The phone or the computer on which you track the market fluctuations run on operating systems developed outside the country. But Union Minister of State for Electronics and IT, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, recently said that the government is planning to come up with a policy that will facilitate an ecosystem for the industry to create an indigenous operating system as an alternative to Google's Android and Apple's iOS. Let us see what it is in our next report. An operating system is a software program required to operate and manage a computing device like smartphone, tablet, computer, smartwatch, etc. It is the operating system that eliminates the need to know coding language to interact with computing devices. At the heart of an operating system is the kernel, which controls all major functions of a computer's hardware. The kernel resides in the system's memory, responsible for memory management and process management. It decides which process gets the processor resources, when and for how much time. Applications that are visible to users like web browsers interact with the kernel through a set of functions called system call interface. The three widely used operating systems for computers are Microsoft's Windows, Apple's Mac OS and open source operating system Linux. Windows is preloaded on most computers except Apple devices. Mac OS comes as preloaded OS on all Apple computers. While Linux is not pre-installed on many computers, it is free to download. In the smartphone segment, Android commands a 70% market share and iOS 30% in India. Other mobile operating systems have a negligible presence. India's plan to support the development of indigenous mobile OS could be aimed at countering the dominance of American tech giants Google and Apple. Previously, companies like Microsoft and BlackBerry had developed their own mobile OS, but they have been discontinued amid the growing influence of Android and iOS. Earlier, the government had attempted to develop its own OS named Bharat Operating System Solutions, which did not find many takers. Indus OS, created by a group of IIT graduates in 2013, also couldn't garner many fans. This time, the government is hopeful to negate the Google-Apple duopoly riding on India's thriving tech startup ecosystem. The government is looking for capabilities within startup and academic ecosystems for development of the indigenous operating system. To this end, the union minister had hinted at plans to come up with a policy that will facilitate India's startups and internet entrepreneurs to develop it. In fact, Indian startups have long been complaining about the charges levied by Apple App Store and Google Play for hosting apps on their platforms. An indigenous operating system also gives the government a degree of control on the apps hosted, data sharing, security and more. The plan is in line with its Atmanirbhar Bharat or Self-Reliant India policy. That is all we have for you today. We will be back with more news and analysis. Stay tuned and thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. 
For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.